Welcome to another edition of the State of Our Faith, an occasional uh, program sponsored by Faith Commons. I'm George Mason, president of Faith Commons, and I'm joined as always by Rabbi Nancy Kasten, who is our chief relationship officer. And we are thrilled today to be able to spend some time together with you talking about Dallas schools, the Dallas Independent School District, and specifically uh, to talk about the bond proposal that is on the ballot right now. For those of you who have voted, you know that. And those of you who haven't, we want to make sure that you know about it. And there's no better person to talk to you about this than our good friend, Miguel Solis. Miguel, we're glad to have you with us. Miguel is a um, retiring DISD trustee, a board member, and he is also the executive director of the Coalition for a New Dallas. And this is uh, exciting for us, uh, Miguel, to have you on and to, to pick your brain because we know that you have been right at the center of so much innovation that's taken place during your tenure with uh, the Dallas Independent School District Board of Trustees, and that you've been in the mix on how to put together this uh, bond issue. And so we're glad to have you, and we want to talk with you more about it. There's so much to talk about, uh, especially maybe the most confusing part to people who are voting is when you get down to the ballot, uh, and you go finally to the propositions and you see that there are actually five propositions having to do with this particular bond election for DISD. Under each one of them at the very end in block letters, it says this is a tax increase. Okay, we need to talk about that certainly, but let's back up and say, uh, Miguel, if you would, $3.7 billion all told, uh, this bond election, tell us what's in it, tell us why we need it, tell us what we can expect if this were to pass. Well, to my friend George, my friend Nancy, thank you so much for taking the time to invite me onto your program to, to talk about what's happening in DISD, uh, all of the great progress that's been going on, and most importantly, as you've uh, beautifully laid it out, what is the $3.7 billion bond and why is it actually not a property tax increase despite what people may see at the bottom of their ballots? But George, I think the, the first thing that I would say is it is very, very important for us to establish a foundation for this conversation. And the foundation I'd like to establish is the fact that Dallas ISD has been rapidly improving over the past five to 10 years. And I think that's important for our viewers to be able to understand. It's important for voters to know because anytime that we go out to the voters to ask them to do anything, you know, they should have an understanding as to whether the, the district deserves it or not. You know, since I got into the district in 2009, there has been a ton of work to try to put a focus on the things that we know would improve academic achievement. Things like uh, improving our teacher pay, professional development and evaluation system, expanding early childhood education so that more kids can get an earlier start. Uh, doing things like creating collegiate and career academies, which will ensure that kids are actually prepared for the 21st century global workforce, and especially that they can fill jobs in our own community. Doing things like taking on equity and banning the practice of out-of-school suspension for our youngest children because it was disproportionately impacting young Black boys, um, and creating the first ever African-American and Mexican-American history uh, courses in not just Dallas ISD, but in the state of Texas, and then that becoming a model for the state to follow as well. These things and many more have led us to be the fastest improving and really the most improved large urban district in the state of Texas. Um, and just this year alone, Georgia and Nancy, this is really just really exciting information. We have been named by HEB as there's a prestigious award they give out each year to the best district in the state. We got that award this year. Um, Eric Hale, who's a teacher in DISD at Burnett Elementary, has won the National Council of Great City Schools Teacher of the Year and was just named the Texas State Teacher of the Year, the first African-American male to ever win that award. Wow. And Dr. Hinojosa was just recently named by the Council of Great City Schools the Nation National Urban Educator of the Year Award. 
So George, you said I was going to be leaving the board. I was retiring. I am, but man, this is a perfect time to retire when we've yeah. got all this stuff going on. So voters need to know Dallas ISD is booming when it comes to academic achievement. And now we're asking you all to help us improve our facilities and the facilities improvements are really what make up the $3.7 billion bond. Very good. Nancy, your, your mute is on. Sorry. So what will happen if the bond doesn't pass? When Then what happens? So let me tell you first what it would do if it did pass. If it passes, the five propositions will essentially allow us to do things like renovate every single campus in some form or fashion all across DISD. And we have roughly 230 campuses. Uh, it'll make sure that we have technology all across our city. And if the pandemic taught us anything about education, one major thing it did teach us is that our kids don't have internet and it's very difficult for them to be able to connect during this pandemic. So we will work towards universal broadband with these bond monies. It'll allow us to do things like make sure that our air conditions at schools work, make sure that if there's asbestos in some of these old schools and there, there tends to, uh, to be cases of that in schools that are, you know, were built in the early 1900s, we can clean that stuff up. Um, it'll allow us to do things like creating a, a performance art facility so that our kids have access to world-class performance art, arts capabilities. Um, and it'll do things like uh, inject racial equity into our policy planning, into our facilities. We've created something called the Community Resource Index that allows us to then target disinvestment that has been uh, due to historical disinvestment and historical policy planning and go into those communities and expand our facilities to basically plug in opportunity gaps in these communities. So, so Nancy, that really answers your question. If it passes, that's what it will do. If it doesn't, and that means that there are roughly $6 billion of needs that will not go addressed. Uh, and that's just, that's just not good for our kids. Well, I mean, I think some people are saying that's all well and good. You know, of course we want equity. Of course we want better facilities. Of course it would be really nice to have a performing arts center for public school kids. But really, you know, now, right now in the time of Corona when the economy is so shaky, I mean, is this the right time to be passing such an enormous bond? I mean, so what do you say about that? First, I mean, it's a very fair question. We're all taxpayers. Um, it's a question that I had myself as we were going through the process once the pandemic ultimately began to impact the economy the way that it has. I think it's very important for viewers to understand though, what a bond does and what a bond doesn't do and how the administration and the board actually control the bond. So Dallas ISD, basically funds our education, both the programming in the school and the facilities where the programming happens through two different buckets of property tax. One of them is our maintenance and operation tax rate. We ask you to give us money to be able to pay for teachers, to be able to pay for a curriculum and so on and so forth. And then our interest and in sinking tax rate. And that's not as large a tax and it's tax that allows us to be able to fund, pay off bonds so that we can keep our facilities, uh, you know, in a good state. We have the 24th, um, we rank 24 out of not many more um, uh, school districts in the, North, in the North Texas region when it comes to INS tax rates. So we're actually under taxing you relative to our peers. So that's one important thing to understand is that we already have a very reasonable tax burden as it stands. The second thing is when we issue a bond, we plan that bond in order to uh, make sure that we don't raise your taxes. And so we're going to what, what, you know, in the bond business, they call amortize, extend the life of the, or the sales of these bonds over the course of 30 years. So as we go to pay uh, back, the, the bond, we will be paying at a tax rate that we believe is not going to ever need to be increased. If the economy decreases, if the economy continues to um, you know, be impacted by, by COVID for an extended amount of, of time, we also don't have to sell these bonds. And if we don't sell these bonds, that's another way for us to ensure that we are not raising your taxes. So that's the way that, that's what the way I think about it is there are so many checks in place and we've planned this bond with conservatives, 
conservative assumptions to really ensure that we don't ever have to ask you to raise your taxes. So why did the state legislature require that that goes on the ballot? It's so confusing. Politics. But what is the advantage of that for them? What, what, what was their thinking? So last legislative session, in an attempt to try to get a unanimous vote, uh, both in the House and in the Senate, uh, when it came to our school finance reform bill, there were a small group of you know, fiscal hawks uh, on the far right of uh, the conservative um, uh, uh, contingent on, uh, in the legislature that basically said, if you want our votes, you need to compromise. And so there was a compromise that was made that basically said, anytime that a municipal institution wants to issue debt, they have to say, we have to say to the voters that this is going to be a property tax increase, regardless of whether it is or it isn't going to be one. And I know that sounds nutty, but I think you also know how our Texas legislature works. And so as an attempt to try to get a unanimous vote, these the far right um, element of the party forced this into the final language of the bill. And so that's why we are having now to have to explain to voters that it actually won't be a tax rate increase. And if there's anyone that has a question as to, well, how could they get away with it? Their rationale is essentially that if you extend debt over the course of you know, some years and that debt accrues interest, then down the road, you may be, you, you know, that a government entity may ask people to pay off that interest by increasing their taxes. So maybe it could be a tax increase. We're not going to do that because of how we've planned the bond and the, the conservative assumptions that we've made and the fact that interest rates right now are very low. And we hope that they will remain for a little bit longer as we begin to issue this initial tranche of debt. So it's just, it's politics and they get away with it every single session. So you, you've talked about politics. Let's be a little more specific about what happened in the last legislative session. So in that session, there was an enormous win, we might say, in, in that there was $11.6 billion school finance bill that was passed that promised to increase funding per student uh, and to reduce property taxes across the state. So the governor said this about that we did something that was considered to be highly improbable. And that is to be able to transform public education in the state of Texas without a court order forcing us to do so. This one law does more to advance education in the state of Texas than any law that I've seen in my adult lifetime in the state of Texas. Now, okay, that's grandiose language. I, I, I also would like to point out that it is the state's responsibility to provide the fun, full funding for public education in the state of Texas and to celebrate that this was such an extraordinary and improbable achievement is an indictment on our politics, not a celebration of it, okay? So let's be clear about that. Well, let's also be clear about the fact that the that the state had been cutting uh, budget money to public education for several legislatures in a row. And this was an attempt to catch up and refund what had already been cut and still has not actually reached a level that it should. And let's also be clear about the support for expansion of charter schools, which drain money from public schools uh, all along the way, as well as the attempt to privatize even more with vouchers that would bleed public education. But at least we can, we can say, yes, we got this funding. But now, excuse my rant, but uh, now, now that we- No, it's good. I, I keep going, George. It's very good. But, but, but now that I've at least Got that out, Miguel. All right. Can you talk for a minute about how the legislature, the state, affects local school districts like the DISD in terms of the parameters it puts on, on funding and what's possible? Uh, because that's one of the reasons we have a bond election, uh, because of the limitations, right? 
Yeah, I mean, it, that was uh, that was a great wind up. And, and look, it's important to understand that, like, at the end of the legislative session, there was a lot of, of uh, you know, congratula congratulatory language amongst legislators. Some of that didn't sit well with me, you know, very much because of, of the reasons that you suggested. But I, I am proud of the fact that our legislature did ultimately do something, and that something is already having an impact in DISD, but we are also now beginning to see some of, um, you know, the offspring of the bill that people weren't paying attention to, that people weren't telling you about, like the fact that you could tank a bond by essentially not being truthful with the taxpayer when they go in to vote for a bond. I don't, I mean, my hope, and we've been working very hard, is that people will pass this bond. However, if people don't Think that they're gonna if they think that they are going to have their taxes increased and they don't vote for it, how, I don't know how we're gonna pass a bond ever moving forward because whoever wants their taxes increased. So we are now starting and, and our legislators need to they need to be reminded about the total bill and how the total bill is impacting our school funding um, and our kids. But the way that the, the, the legislature essentially controls education is it's really through funding. I mean, we, we carry a lot of funds from the state and without those funds, it significantly impacts us. And the ramifications of them cutting 5 billion back in 2011 meant that we had to close 12 schools. And uh, that was very difficult as, um, as an administration, as a board. I wasn't on there, but as soon as I got on, I saw the devastation that, that those cuts caused. Um, but what this bill did was it essentially took sort of the same approach that like uh, uh, President Obama took with the race to the top grants. It's essentially using funding to incentivize districts to do certain things. Um, early childhood education would have been one. It allowed us to now expand early childhood education. Extended year learning. This is something that we are really looking at right now to try to mitigate learning loss from COVID. If we want funding from the state to do that, we now have the ability to do it, but we can't like those monies can only be used to extend the year. So there's sort of like a carrot and a stick approach to the funding. And they, in some ways, if you don't want to do what they want you to do, then you don't get the funding. Can you say a word, Miguel, about why it's the bond proposal is broken out into five categories? So I, I think the vast majority of this money is for facilities improvements and for technology, but there are, uh, you, you couldn't bundle it all into one, it had to be broken out. Can you say why that is? Also part of the HB3 bill. Um, okay. we, anytime that you are asking for uh, things like technology now, or things like athletic facilities now, or things like performance art facilities now, uh, or swimming pools now, you have to you have to segment the bond. So Proposition A is is for the bulk of like construction, renovation, um, you know, our HVAC systems, the the racial equity uh, student resource centers. That is going to be three point two billion, um, and then the rest are you know sort of yeah a, a much smaller amount in the single digit percentages. But again, this was politics. Some legislators wanted to be able to kill things like the Allen football stadium that passed and was 67 something or hundred million. It was, a, it was a significant amount and they felt like that wasn't a good use of taxpayer dollars. And so they wanted to be able to single out concepts like that for voters to be able to vote against. Um, first time ever, last time we passed a bond in 2015 at $1.6 billion or $1.5 billion, it was just one vote that we were asking people of, um, so politics. You know, Miguel, you're ta you were talking about how nobody ever wants to raise their taxes. And, you know, I was thinking about, um, well, I was thinking about the fact that I went to public school in Newton, Massachusetts, all the way through high school. My husband went to public school in New York all the way through high school. We had great educations, went to really prestigious universities, all of that. But when we came to Texas, we decided to go the private school route. And it began with wanting our kids to have a Jewish education. 
But, um, you know, when I think about it now, David and I made that decision without really taking into account all of the benefits of public education that have sort of contributed to our whole attitude toward um, the role of public education in democracy, right? I mean, not only did I go to public school, but my father, whose parent, my parent, my grandparents were immigrants. My father benefited from an incredible public school education in New York. And only because of that were his children able to then, you know, get their education and, and, and um, you know, get to the point where we are today, where we're, we live in a beautiful house in a beautiful neighborhood with very, very, very low property taxes. And, you know, um, we were fortunate enough to be able to send our kids to private schools in some ways, but our decision also reflected a lack of faith in public education that now, you know, I see was caused by systemic underinvestment, not just money, but just people's investment in a public school system with time and talent and, and, and thought and, you know, government engagement. Um, and so I realize now that like, you know, by opting out of that system, we contributed to that underinvestment, even though we didn't intend to do that. So what can we do? I mean, part of me thinks, well, maybe I do have to pay more taxes if I want to reverse this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, which isn't even consistent or realistic that private schools and charter schools give a better education than our Dallas public schools. I mean, that's not even true in a lot of cases, but if we wanna reverse that perception, um, what do we need to do? Well, here's the thing, Nancy, thank, thank you for sharing that beautiful story. I think, um, I think it's important to understand a few things. One, and let me just reiterate, this bond will not be, uh, to the voter, to the, to the viewers, this bond will not be a tax increase. However, when we have asked for voters to raise their taxes for Dallas ISD, they did it. And they did it with 60% of the vote back in 2018. And um, that tax ratification election allowed us to do things like expand early childhood education, pay our teachers more, create these mixed socioeconomic integration schools, which I'll talk about in just a second. But like Dallas, Dallas, Voters want Dallas ISD to succeed. And when we have asked them for a tax increase, they have increased their taxes. Now, we brought the tax rate back down because of the school finance legislation. So it's actually where it was before we asked them to raise their taxes. But that's what's also so. The state so is making us keep our taxes low, even though so we, we brought our. That's exactly right. We brought our taxes back down because basically what we were able to get from the taxpayers. Um, back in 2018, we've now been able to get from the state. So we brought, we could bring their tax uh, rate back down. However, that's what's very disheartening about this bond process is that now, like, we are not asking to raise their taxes. And, but we have that they are under the impression that we are. And had we have decided to actually raise their taxes and create a campaign around it, I'm certain that the voters would have supported us on that too. But it's just so disingenuous. But you know, one of the things that I think is so important for people to understand, especially middle class and upper class uh, families with children in our community, is that if you go to Dallas ISD, you can get a high quality education. And the historical disinvestment and segregation of our city and the actual intentional policies that created a narrative about our public schools that really in some ways fueled in the second half of the 20th century, white flight, um, it has it has really, really been hard to pull back from. However, and if you don't mind, I'd like to share just a couple of slides with you. Um, here's what we're seeing happens when the middle class bring their kids back into DISD. So Nancy, I mentioned to you this idea of mixed socioeconomic integration schools. These are our choice schools, which don't, uh, to get into these schools, uh, it does not require anything but an application. You don't have to take a test. You don't have to pass, um, you know, uh, uh, some, you know, merits. You just have to apply, and it's a lottery. But 50% of the kids that get in have got to be lower income, and the other 50% have got to be middle to upper income. Solar Preparatory School for Girls was one of these first schools. And when we look at things like 2019 STAR data, um, 
and we compare solar prep for girls versus Highland Park, what we're seeing is we're getting, we're either doing better or, we, or we're just behind them on uh, star data. And so this is the master's uh, reading and math data for the 2019 star. And this is the meets data for 2019 star. And when you, when you look at those data, you know, you wonder like 51% of these kids at solar prep, they're lower income. And the other 49% are middle to upper income. They're doing just as good at, at, as Highland Park and they are significantly outperforming the state. And then when you go and you look at our white students that are in solar prep for girls versus the children that are in Highland Park, they are outperforming the children at Highland Park in an integrated classroom. So I say that to simply say, public school is not this scary thing. And in fact, it actually helps us, the total body of students, when we have our middle-class and upper-class kids come back to the public school system. Their achievement does not decrease. It actually stays the same or increases and everyone else around them does as well. And then the societal impact that that has when, when black and brown and white kids from all walks of life are in the same classroom, that is what our society needs, especially right now. So integrated education, when done right, works best for kids. And we just, we need more of it in our, in our city. So I think it's an interesting point that you make because uh, what has to change is the narrative. And part of what Nancy was talking about when she and David made the decision about uh, their own kids and school is what a lot of parents are dealing with. Okay, we have this decision to make. Now let's listen to uh, all the stories that our friends and our neighbors are telling us, uh, people in our congregations are telling us about where your kids have to go to school and why, right? So the, the question is, how does that narrative change in favor of a, a, a neighborhood public school education instead of a charter school or a private school education uh, that would take them out of this integrated mix of, of students that we know has both a basic educational benefit and very much so a societal impact because of the multiculturalism and the fluency uh, that people would have in terms of learning how to live together and work together with people uh, sometimes who don't look like you. Uh, it, it, in, in San Antonio, some of you uh, might know that uh, my daughter, Cameron Vickery, who is actually moderating this particular uh, meeting right now, uh, helped to start a group called Rooted. Rooted. Uh, that, and, and, and this is all behind, uh, the whole reason for it was this very thing. My little granddaughters were getting ready to start school and she was hearing all these narratives from her uh, friends about why they needed to go to some place other than their local school. And she began to ask why that is and on what basis were they making that decision. And they, so they, they created this group called Rooted where the, the, the goal is to tell the story uh, of your local public school. Uh, so that people hear the real story. There's no marketing dollars, you know, for, for public schools to go out there and tell the story of that local school, whereas charters have it, private schools have it, and they're all trying to change the narrative in their favor. So what we're talking about here is how can we even the stakes in a sense, right? How can we, how can we make the, the playing field level and part of what's going on is reinvesting where there has been disinvestment so that it looks, feels, and seems just as it's performing at an equal level, uh, that it's, it's the right competition and the right place to go. I mean, it's, uh, it is both a great question and a Gordian knot. Um, there isn't any one particular thing that I think that we can do. There are buckets of things that I think that we can do. And the first is the school system actually has to perform, right? Mm -hmm. We actually have to have a good product that is mm -hmm. uh, appealing to people from all walks of life. And the good news is when we first started our conversation this afternoon, I laid out 
the improvement that Dallas ISD has been on for the past five to 10 years. But I've got to say, George, that a lot of the changes that we had to make in order to increase academic achievement, the innovation that manifests from those changes, some of those things were politically unpopular. And it took a community that was willing to stand behind tough change to then get us to the point where we would see the, uh, this achievement improve and this, in, in this innovation attract people back to the system. So first thing would be Dallas ISD has got to continue to keep its eye on improving academic achievement regard, regardless of the politics and our community needs to stand behind this continued change, uh, which will continue to be difficult. I think the second thing is for our families who are deciding to actually choose DISD, we need to both as a district empower them to help share their story, and we need them to be willing to share that story and push back against the false narrative. Um, we've got, we're, we're continuing to expand our vo volunteer and partnerships organization within DISD and our partnerships outside. There's a great organization called United to Learn, and it is quickly growing into a key intermediary between the community and DISD helping us both improve academic achievement by volunteering in schools and create a compelling narrative to the community about why DISD um, matters. So that would be a great organization that I would put, I would push interested people um, to kind of consider. Um, but then if you don't have a kid in DISD, if you are uh, either someone who is, who's putting your kids uh, uh, in, a, in a different school system, someone who is just having kids thinking about where you want to go, I would ask you to just go look at your neighborhood DISD school. That's the first thing. The second thing would be go to dallasisd.org, search in our schools of choice all of the other schools that we've got that may not be your traditional neighborhood school um, that also provide a high quality education like Solar Preparatory School for Girls. And lastly, if you don't have a kid, you're not having to make that decision. I guarantee you you're going to be in a conversation with someone who's going to tell you that DISD is not a good school system. And I would ask you to just challenge that thought. Ask them, what data do you have that suggests that that's the case? When was the last time you were in a DISD school? And what I found is when you push back tactfully, that most of that misperception goes away, and then they're ready to have a conversation about what's actually happening, happening in DISD. Those are a host of things that I think that we can do to continue to, to, to help us along this journey. Nancy, I think it would be helpful to recount also what public education does for our society. In other words, there are people who might not be eager to support this bond proposal because they might think, despite what we're trying to say, that, that it's going to cost them more in tax dollars, but it may be that they don't have children in school at all, they're older adults, uh, or it may be that their kids attend private school. But why is it, though, that we should all be supporting something like a bond election to increase uh, the vitality of our local public schools? What, what does this do for our society? Well, I mean, just so many things, and I think every person would have their own answer. But I, I was thinking about, you know, talking about the bond issue and how we take out a loan to buy our home, right? And then we pay it back over time. And the bank, you know, we're trusted to do that. And if we don't, we get penalized for it, right? Well, I mean, Dallas is our home. And, you know, if we don't invest in all of the neighbors, our, our, our neighbors around us, not just our own children, or our own grandchildren, or our own ourselves, but but everyone here, then we're never going to feel like it is our home. You know, we have to invest in our home in order to feel connected to our home, in order to feel like it is our home, because these are our neighbors. We can't keep just saying, oh, well, they have nothing to do with me. I can just pretend they don't exist. No, these are, these are our neighbors. These are our um, fellow residents in our home of Dallas. So, um, and, and not, you know, and of course, the other thing is that a high quality public education is the um, absolute foundation of a well functioning society. And we think about how much damage is done in terms of critical thinking and being, and in a time like today, especially when 
you know, we're getting distracted and misinformed about all kinds of things. If we don't have a public school system that's really intent on teaching every single citizen of this country or every single resident of this country um, how to tell truth from fiction, telling, you know, explaining that there are more than one narrative to any story, right? There isn't just one history. There are a lot of histories, but let's figure out how to understand those and see them, see our country as, you know, telling a whole holistic story. You know, and so I also wanted to ask, I mean, I, George, I don't want to interrupt. Maybe you and Miguel want to add something to that, but I have another question after we finish that part of the conversation. Well, hold, hold that thought. I, I, I just, I think we should also, you know, just reinforce the fact that public education uh, is not something that families should choose as a last resort. It's a first choice, not a last chance that people should have when they go to think about education, because this is the place where everybody gets in the mix together. And this is where the, the dynamic of American democracy is, is being practiced is in a public school classroom. You know, but before you get to the city council, before you get to your corporate boardroom and find all of this diversity that exists, uh, but before you engage in the larger population and, and, and have to deal with the fact that there is a much broader world out there than in your particular family, your particular congregation or your particular neighborhood, well, you practice this experiment in democracy and, and this is a laboratory for life. Uh, and, and so rather than pulling out and reinforcing all those distinctions, being able to do that in a public school classroom really uh, is a secret for a well-functioning democracy. And again, I would just add, you know, you both have beautifully stated uh, why it's so important that we both have a public education institution in the United States of America. And additionally, why it's important to support it. But like, even if you were still stuck on this idea of, you know, I don't know if my kid's gonna get a good education if they go to public school, which is something that is just repeated over and over when the, the facts of the matter are, are very different than what that misperception uh, suggests. You actually look at what happens when we integrate our schools. It is one of the best tried and true practices to ensuring high academic achievement. And this all came you go back, uh, you know, with Brown versus Board of Education in 54, after that, we had a report that was done. It was issued um, in, during the LBJ administration, uh, but it was done by a professor named James Coleman. It's the Coleman Report. And really the Coleman Report, to this day, the findings have stood pretty solid. He found when you get kids from all walks of life together, you really don't see anything but a positive benefit in any way that you would wanna cut data or experience. It's, it was true then, it's still true now. So there really is no good argument at this point for why you shouldn't, as you said, George, have public education as your first choice. And then after that first choice, and there are many choices amongst the first choice, right. then looking at these other things to say, well, maybe I want a, a different education. That's, that's the way that I hope uh, we'll start thinking about it moving forward. And I think that's also why, you know, some people will say, well, okay, fine, we'll invest in academics, but why are we building a football stadium or a sports facility? Why are we building an auditorium? Why are we, you know, funding arts programs? And, you know, we have to realize that not only won't more affluent people want to go to those schools if they don't, they don't have those uh, resources, but also, you know, when you look at the orchestras and the teams and the Olympic athletes of today, if, if we don't have a way of training them that's equal and accessible to every single um, child in our country, then we're never going to see, we're, we won't be reflected. We, A, we won't excel because our pool will be so narrow, but B, it won't reflect who we really are as a country and all of our strengths. And also like it's, you know, if we don't give, if our families don't get 
the you know athletic facility or they don't get the natatorium or they don't get the performance arts center you know in many cases and this is just plain economic facts of of the dallas isd population where else do they go they don't have they don't have the agency to then go to like the you know the neighborhood like um community swimming center because you know in many cases our communities don't have that or if they have that the entire community is using it and so it can be difficult that they don't have that agency so you know i think it's i think people get that right i think um in this they've gotten it in every bond that i've ever been a part of or any bond that i know that dallas isd has ever gone after they have invested which again is just why this is this language is so disappointing especially because it just it just comes from politics and it has the ability of potentially robbing families of an investment that is good for the public in general. So, so let me just, oh, go ahead. Let, let me just say that Nancy and I came to Dallas about the same time. Uh, Nancy's husband, David, is the uh, senior rabbi at Temple Emmanuel. Uh, fact to, to note, Nancy does not work for Temple Emmanuel. Uh, she works for Faith Commons, just let's stipulate that. But our two congregations that we inherited wonderful communities, fabulous people. But if you looked at our facilities 30 years ago, both of them, I'm speaking for you, Nancy, but both of them were very dated. They were uh, inaccessible in terms of handicapped accessibility. They were um, they were bare bones. They reflected another age. They, they had smaller uh, classrooms for children and things like that. And, and, and in both cases, our congregations have spent millions and millions of dollars transforming our buildings and facilities on our property to create a better educational environment for all ages, and in our case, worship, but uh, but the point is to build our community, and, and that has improved the spirit and the desire to gather, the desire to learn, and it has reinvigorated both of our congregations over these past decades because we've been willing to transform the facilities, the brick and mortar, the way that, that we uh, pay for electricity and for uh, heating and cooling and, and, and access to uh, even, even to gathering for social purposes, which is part of what we're talking about when it comes to athletic events and in terms of the parallel. So there is a kind of parallelism here. I think if people realized what they've done at their local congregations or in their own homes even to remodel and improve the, the, the experience. It's not just building the value, it's, it's also building the experience of being alive together. Can I make a point, George, too? Because I, I have a, a colleague uh, who is such a dynamic young woman. Her name is Carla Garcia. She's the first Latina ever elected to the Dallas School Board. Think about it for a second. Yeah. The first Latina ever elected to the Dallas right. School Board. She is 23 or 24 years old. She's the youngest I've ever been elected to the board as well. And what she's accomplished in her life to date is it's, it's absolutely outstanding. It, it is phenomenal and it's a story uh, that more people need to hear. But when we were talking about the bond, she shared a story with me that was really, um, you know, it was really, it was both touching and heartbreaking at the same time. She remembers going as a, either in elementary or middle school, going to SMU to go see the campus and being told one day you can, you can be here, you could go to SMU, you have that potential. She remembers going and seeing the campus and the aesthetics of the campus and leaving the campus thinking, I'll never go there and I'm not sure that I ever want to go there. And she said the reason why was because it was just overwhelming to see a campus that looked like that, but to go to a campus that was the antithesis of that, a Dallas ISD school that, that was significantly under-resourced in a disinvested community. So the mindset that uh. kids have as they go to these facilities and, and to our facilities, walking into crumbling buildings and HVACs, that air condition that works one day and doesn't work right. another it plays on their minds. It plays on their aspirations. And luckily, Carla broke through. But how many other Carla Garcia? Right, right. 
you know, just because of the way a building looks may not see uh, them doing some of these, these amazing things. Wonderful. Nancy. So, yeah. So Miguel, you were saying that, you know, gala sites really want to do the best we can for DISD and we could probably do better, but we're heading, you know, we seem to have our hearts in the right place. There's another legislative session coming up starting in January. What do you see our role, whoever gets elected to this Texas state legislature, and of course we'll know that sometime after November 3rd, um, what can be our role in terms of advocating for, first of all, you know, transparency and, you know, let's get what we, what they say we're going to get and, but also um, advocating for public schools. Yeah, like the major thing, Nancy, um, my answer would have been extremely different six months ago uh, and then COVID-19. So we know that the state's budget is going to, is taking a hit. Um, and because Dallas ISD relies so heavily on the state budget, um, any cuts to education would be, would hurt us. Um, and any cuts to HB3 would significantly hurt us because as George asked earlier, you know, how does the legislature play a role in local education? Well, with HB3, it incentivized districts like DISD to do certain things. We have begun to do those things in hopes that we would receive money. And if we don't receive those monies because there's a cut this next legislative cycle, then we're gonna have to completely change course uh, on, on what we do. And we will have to make cuts and those cuts could come in a whole host of places. That's, so number one is just protecting HB3, protecting the funding streams that are now open to us. But then the second thing would be asking our legislature to take a good hard look at stuff like saying you're gonna increase property taxes for people when you're not going to increase property taxes for people, especially when that, the implication of that means that you may not be able to improve your facilities in your city, in our case, your school facilities, ever again, because people don't wanna have their taxes raised. So that would be another thing that I hope um, comes from this. And again, my hope is that we pass this bond, but in the case that not enough people receive the message that it wouldn't be a tax increase and they vote against the bond, there are going to be a lot of people all across the state up in arms because every municipal institution that ever wanted to in improve their facility is going to have to tell people they're increasing taxes when that's not the case. I don't think people are going to be happy about it. And that only applies to independent school districts, correct? It doesn't apply to anything else. My understanding is it's municipal institutions that go to issue debt. It's again, I'm still learning about this language. Uh, as well, so I, there could be other things in there that I'm not uh, I'm not sure about either. So <laughs> we need to we need to really take a good hard look at the totality of HB three. Let, let me just say that there's also when, when we look at this bond election, there I I hear the critics of it uh, as each of you uh, may uh, picking at certain things. You know things like you know the uh, the building of stadiums rather than teacher pay, or the, uh, the possibility that nonprofit organizations are going to benefit most with, and without accountability for the community services portion of this, and, uh, and, and the reinforcing of uh, DISD's progress through uh, ACE database testing of teachers and pay and things of that nature. All of these, I would just say, are, are arguments that should be within the family about, uh, uh, about how we improve education, but they shouldn't be about whether we adequately fund DISD to do the basic things that we all know need to be done. And voting against this bond proposal because you have a philosophical difference about teacher pay or data, uh, data driven uh, approach to things or of school choice or of whatever the case may be. This, it seems to me, is an argument that should be ongoing within the family, but not uh, to invalidate or defeat a bond proposal like this. Yeah, you know, it's a very good point, George. And I think that 
people vote if if people vote against the bond, I think that there are a few reasons why they do it. One is that they are just confused about what a bond is versus um, you know anything else that DISD would be asking uh, voters for support of, and they're just so confused, and so they say, "Well, I'm going to vote against it because I don't know enough about it." I think another reason is, and this is just from a very, very small but loud subset of individuals, is exactly what you just talked about. Uh, you know, questions about the way that Dallas ISD has decided to improve academic achievement, not agreeing with the policies, the programmatic approaches that we've done it. I would make the argument that student achievement's on the rise. So you can, you know, you disagree with the approach that was taken, but kids' lives are, you know, significantly exponentially better than they had been prior to these things. And but that's such a vocal subset, and it's everybody screaming at each other, which ends up being ten people on Facebook and like private groups. So, but then the third reason, again, is just questions about how the money is going to work itself out, and you know if it's going to be a tax increase or not, or people just not agreeing with people taking out debt. So I can imagine those, really those three buckets being the reasons why people might vote against it, but there are far too many reasons to vote for it, much of which we've discussed today. Um, and if you're not compelled by any of that, I think the most simple thing you need to ask yourself is, do I want kids to go to schools that they can, that will keep them safe, they can be proud of in my city, or do I not? And that's honest, that's, that is it, it's that binary of a choice. Okay. Nancy. Well, thank you both so much and Miguel, especially for being our guest today. I hope that we provided some clarity for people about this bond issue. I also want to just mention that I hear that on some ballots, this is the only thing on the back of the mail-in ballot. So for anybody who's getting a mail-in ballot, make sure to turn your ballot over and uh, fill it out. Vote for those bond um, proposals A through E. And now let's just take a moment to give gratitude for this time together, to thank the Holy One of Blessing for the abundance that we are blessed with, to remind ourselves that we have enough to share with everyone if we claim our knowledge, our insight, our discernment, our wisdom, and let us use all of these aspects of knowing to make sure that each and every human being for whom we are responsible as a neighbor is able to live with dignity, with health, with a sense of hope and possibility. Again, thank you, God, for all this time that we get to spend together trying to do your work in the world. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Nancy, as always, for blessing us, and Miguel, for being our guest. We are so grateful for all the work you do in Dallas and for your friendship, and we look forward to other ways uh, that you'll be serving in Dallas, um, perhaps through the Coalition for New Dallas, and uh, other ways that uh, you may be led to lead. Thank you, George and Nancy. It's been, an, it's been great chatting with you on this beautiful Sunday. And I want to encourage everyone to like us on Facebook, Faith Commons, and go to the website, faithcommons.org, where you can subscribe to our newsletter and you can find lots of resources there, uh, including resources about public education. And so we'll uh, be glad to hear from you. You can email us. And we'll be glad to communicate more. It may be that you have questions that were raised during this particular program. Uh, until the next time, uh, with State of Our Faith, I'm George Mason. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>